starting this monthly um, Forex Fridays to try and give a little more interactive opportunities for, for webinars um, to provide on a themed basis each month. My, my name is Mark Pryor. I'm the chair of the Forex Network. I'm actually from the UK's Forestry Commission, um, representing both the Forest Commission and Forest Research. And I'd like to welcome all our members, but also all our friends from across Europe, hopefully, who will be joining today and can join us um, in future months as well. Um, just going to move on to see if I can. Okay. Um, just first of all, I'll start off with some housekeeping. So we are recording the session, so please be aware of that, and that will be available on um, the European Forest Institute's um, YouTube channel and also the Forex website. Um, please, can you keep your microphones muted and, and if asked, also turn off videos if we have some problems with broadband width, etc. Um, there will be opportunities to put chat and also to raise your hand to get um, to better raise questions and things. So today we're going to be um, talking about adapting extension activities in the context of the pandemic. Um, so it's going to be an interactive webinar session. We've got two speakers, um, and so I'll just have a short introduction about what the Forex Network is. Um, Nula um, Neela Herita from um, Chagas in Ireland is going to facilitate the day, the morning, and also um, the two presentations from Stephen Mayan from Chagas and Ian Baker from the Small Woods Association. So, Forex. So, the network was officially launched in 2019 at a meeting in, in Norway, as shown in the picture. Um, and although we had been planning it for a couple of years before that, and it was in a, sort of inspired by the, the uh, Finnish Forest Centre, uh, supported by the EFI um, back in 2017. So currently we've got 14 members um, and, the sec and with a secretariat running of six of the, of the members running the organisation. Um, and we're coordinated by, by the EFI. Um, we've got 40 members, but we're, we're representing 11 different countries from around Europe, and you can see the list, oops, the list of those members there. Um, we also have a number, about half a dozen observer organisations, um, and we're all, always open to new membership, and it would be good to develop the network right away across Europe. So um, what we actually aim to do for our members is it's really around supporting organisations that support private forest owners. And the sort of things we'll be doing would be building capacities in training ed and education, developing forest associations, supporting forest inventories towards management planning, um, but also um, things like forest legislation. Um, a lot of the organisations provide subsidies um, for forest owners. I will also be supporting uh, things like marketing and general capacity building. So Forest Fridays, um, I'll pass over to Nula in a second, but um, the idea is that we'll be running these sessions on a monthly basis on the last Friday of each month. So I'd just like to highlight that next month we'll be running one on voluntary carbon schemes and uh, Benjamin uh, Caffelet from CNPF in France will be facilitating that session. And we'll hear, hear about the label um, Bas Cabon from France and also the, um, the UK England, um, the Woodland Carbon Code and um, uh, friends from Forest Research will be supporting that one. Um, anyway, I will pass over to Nula, but before I do that, just to say that um, Natasha um, Leverack is our key um, person at, who's in the picture there. Um, is our key person from EFI, um, supported by MINA. Um, so if any of you have are aware, want, are interested in joining the organisation of the network, then please contact um, Natasha. Anyway, I'll pass over to Nulo. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, good afternoon, and you're all very welcome to the first Forex Friday. Um, as Mark said, my name is Nuala Nilahartha and I'm head of the Chagas Forestry Development Department in Ireland. 
And just for you, those of you who don't know, Chagask is an Irish government agency which provides agricultural and forestry advice, training and research support to landowners. And so to the topic of our first Forex Friday, we will discuss adapting extension activities in the context of COVID-19, which hopefully is quite topical at the moment. Um, as you all only know too well, as members of the network, the past year has been very challenging to the ongoing delivery of many of our services for many of our member organisations. And this has been particularly challenging for those who are providing direct support to clients, who in our case are mostly landowners and forest owners. Now, while many industrial back office and in, indeed research roles can continue pretty much as normal with some adaptations, the situation for extension support services has been quite different and challenging. Um, many of our forest and landowner clients depend on accessing our range of one-to-one -one services and group support services to progress their plans for their forests and manage them appropriately. And for those of you who are foresters, you know there's nothing quite as nice as walking in a forest with an owner or a group of owners providing support to them in relation to optimizing their resources and achieving their objectives. I suppose seeing is believing is a good saying, and many of our clients are all comfortable and engaged, availing of extension supports while in the forest than they would be, say, in a more formal setting, such as indoors or online. Now, however, COVID-19 has made us reconsider how we operate. In fact, many of us probably have had to, I suppose, reinvent ourselves and our roles to some extent, mm -hmm. while still trying to be effective in delivering our services. And this has fostered innovation and maybe encouraged some of us, and that I include myself in this, to make that digital leap. However, at, some, as, at the same time, we have to be conscious that the profile of some of our clients may mean that they have a limited capacity to upskill in relation to digital communications. And I suppose we have to avoid alienating such clients. So we will start with two presentations this morning. And bear in mind that this is an interactive session this morning, or this afternoon, I should say. We're, we are conscious that we are an hour behind the rest of you there, at least. And we would be very much appreciate your comments and inputs. We, would, uh, we should have time for a fairly good discussion at the end of the presentations. So in relation to your interactions, you have two options on this. Right throughout the session this morning, you can submit a written question, a comment at any stage on the chat function. And that's, I think, at the bottom of your screen. And you will, we will get to it later during the discussions. Your second option is to wait until after the discussion uh, or after the two presentations when we have a discussion and you can use the raise hand function, and you can see the little hand at the bottom of your screen in relation to this. So moving to our present, first presentation, um, it's my colleague, Stephen Mayan from Chagask. Um, Stephen studied close to nature forestry at the State University of Ghent in Belgium, and has since worked in forestry in Belgium, Nepal, Rwanda, Northern Ireland, and in recent years in Donegal in the Republic of Ireland. His experience includes research on the conversion of man-made conifer plantations to biodiverse woodlands and also on establishing, managing and regenerating hedgerows and woodlands. Stephen currently works as a forestry development officer with Chagask, providing independent advisory and training services to forest owners in Donegal. In addition, he is the forestry communications and digital media coordinator for the Chagask Forestry Development Department and continues uh, and contributes a regular forestry feature on a national newspaper, along with contributions to a wide range of other media outlets. His presentation this morning is on adapting to a new virtual reality forestry advisory services during COVID-19. Over to you, Stephen. Okay. Um... Good morning to you all. Uh, thank you very much for having me um, this morning. Um, I will try to give an overview of what Nula there um, introduced. Uh, before I do so, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Yes, yes. yes. yes we can. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, Grant. Okay, in that case, I will try. <laughs> 
to start uh, sharing my presentation. And I hope everything will go to plan um, because that would be a little bit embarrassing if that didn't work too well. And share. And um, okay, can you see something? Yes. Yes, perfect. yes that's perfect. Okay. Yeah. Grant, okay, good. So basically, as Nula said, in this presentation, I will try to describe how we adapted providing forestry advisory services during the COVID pandemic. Um, but I also think it's important that before I do so, that I just place the forestry development department, what it actually does. So what is our role? We provide independent forestry services to private forest owners in Ireland. And that means research, advice and training. And because it's a one house or a one stop shop, if you wish, I believe that this in-house research capacity significantly benefits our advisory and training services because it allows for a rapid and effective knowledge transfer. Because also we are all working in the one under the one roof, it also allows for a very close cooperation between researchers and advisors. So we have research, we have advisory services. So how <clears throat> so how do we communicate that information? Well, before COVID, when the world was uh, still uh, normal, let's say, we used to organize a wide range of various uh, activities and naturally enough, office consultations. We deal with a very wide range of questions. For instance, somebody is considering establishing a forest, uh, managing um, management questions, timber sales questions, interaction with other agricultural support schemes and so on. Forest walks are highly effective to bring people up to date with the latest research, provide best practice guidelines and so on. And probably forest owners appreciate one-to-one -one site visits um, most of all um, because they can ask specific questions and in confidence without the nosy neighbors finding out, which is really important. Um, and then it also means that both researchers and advisors would regularly attend large agricultural shows, giving people the opportunity to call in and maybe ask tree related questions, you know, ranging from, I want to plant a tree in the garden to um, my forest, um, I'm about to start harvesting timber. What should I watch out for in my uh, contract? We also organize a wide range of skills courses ranging from timber measurement courses, as you can see here in this picture, or formative shaping and pruning workshops when it comes to broad leaves, growing trees from seed and so on. Every year, we organize a number of national forestry conferences in various locations across Ireland. It's a great way to get a message across to many people at the same time, but I also believe strongly that it's a social gathering where forest owners can meet up with each other, exchanging idea and having a chat with the neighbor that they may, may not have seen for, for quite a while. And then COVID arrived. So when Ireland entered its first lockdown in early March, we had to adapt very fast to this new reality because we are social animals. We like to come together. And as a result of COVID, our seminars became webinars. And instead of seminars, we started doing live broadcasts, as you can see in this picture. So instead of a live uh, conference, we had to start live broadcasting. We also started organizing webinars. Our normal approach would be to maybe have two or three short presentations followed by an extended Q&A session, giving people an opportunity to ask questions of the experts. We very quickly had to become familiar with platforms such as Zoom, and it's still, we're still on the learning curve here. 
our office consultations became phone or Zoom consultations. It's not the same as a face-to-face -face meeting, but it is adequate in the circumstances. It works just about. And then instead of site visits, we now have videoed site visits. The farmer would maybe record a short video on his or her phone and send it on to be discussed over the phone afterwards. As I said earlier, it's not perfect, but it works. Our e-newsletters became a very important communication tool. It's cost effective and with a fast turnaround. Because for instance, we were able to uh, let people know within a couple of hours what the new COVID regulations meant for all of us. Um, I doubled the number of broadcasts to cope with the, uh, our own increase in digital offerings, but also because of that increased demand. Our e-newsletters also had a knock-on effect on our website as they are strongly coordinated. Our website, website was important before COVID, but COVID made it even more important. And I believe strongly for that for a website to be useful, it has to be user focused. It must provide current up-to-date information and it also must be trustworthy above all. Uh, fake news is just out. As a result of the pandemic, content increased substantially. It's also true to say, I think, that many people prefer to watch a video rather than reading 500 words. We provide different types of video that can range from a research update, as you can see here, to technical how-to videos. How do you cut an inspection path in a young conifer woodland? We also provide regulatory information, including felling license information or taxation information. And as a result of the pandemic, we again produced more videos. As Nula mentioned earlier, I write a monthly forestry feature for Ireland's largest newspaper. Um, <laughs> although the paper has more than half a million daily readers, I don't think they all read my forestry column though. And then also group texts. Texting out to forest owners is, I think, a very effective uh, way to communicate because we find that most people will read a text message. I think the, the statistic says something around 80%, which is extremely high. And then also naturally enough, uh, social media, various social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram are very useful for highlighting important topics, upcoming events, and so on. So in summary, the COVID pandemic certainly demonstrated the importance of effective and relevant communication methods. So for that to happen, what do we need? Well, first of all, we need time. Time is a very precious commodity, and as, as we all know, and we all would like a bit more of it. All of the above require a substantial time input with very strict, tight, deadlines usually. Then also flexibility. That's also very important because that means the ability to respond rapidly. For instance, one minute you think you think you're organizing a seminar, the next minute it becomes a webinar. You also must be able to provide increased web content, produce more videos, and so on. Equipment. Naturally enough, you do need some equipment for the above like video cameras and so on, and that means budgets. But I also believe that you can do a lot with a limited amount of gear. Skills, expertise are also needed. You must be able to operate a camera, edit the video afterwards, be able to use the software for e-newsletters, for the software for the website, and so on. And then, just so, well, just to be clear about it, that all, all this is a team effort. None of the above will happen without the input, cooperation, and support from colleagues. It very much is a team effort. So, our plans, what are our plans? Well, 
we will further develop webinars. We want to make use of breakout rooms, organize polls during, the, during a webinar and so on. We also will need to restructure the website so that it can manage the increased content better. This year, because we're all hearing about vaccines, are they coming, are they not coming? Will they be very effective or not? And that means that this year we will need to offer a blended program of events in case we need to deal with either new or existing COVID restrictions. But hopefully we can also switch back to events on the ground as well as the case as, as it was before COVID came along. Also, as Nula pointed out, we will continue to support digitally, less digitally inclined forest owners to help them embrace this new digital reality. I also started making use of animation recently. I believe that this is another effective way to get messages across. And here is an example of an animation video that I made last week. Now, I hope it is going to work okay and that the sound will play. So let's, let's go. Now, I hope that came across fairly okay. Otherwise, you have 37 seconds of a, of a break. But I think animation uh, and uh, animation videos, I think they're quite useful. For instance, to highlight an upcoming event, maybe explain a concept. And I also believe it's a more engaging way to present terribly boring statistics. So finally, to finish up, you'll be glad to hear what take home messages do I have? Well, the lessons that we have learned is the importance of effective and relevant communication methods. You can't do everything. You know, you must make priorities and decide on a particular course forward. You also need to respond rapidly. Very important that you're in a position to do so. And resources, naturally enough, are required. And that means time and or money. And I also believe that you have to keep renewing. Standing still means going back. You must renew, you must try something new, a different way to engage people, a different audience, a different target group that you're trying to reach. So um, then, and then finally, um, if you would like a bit more information, you can go to our website. It is chagas.ie forward slash forestry. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it of some interest. Okay, thanks for that, Stephen. Um, uh, hopefully that was of interest to people. And I suppose the challenge is to keep the best from the COVID lockdown. And do you think our services will go back to the way it was once the pandemic hopefully has been controlled? I no, I don't think so. I think now that we have, um, let's say, broached that digital uh, wall, I think that the future means a blended program because I believe that there are definitely advantages to a digital approach. But I also think there are disadvantages, and I think the future means that it will be a combination of a digital webinars, videos, um, website offerings, e-newsletters. But I also believe that you cannot do away with site visits, office consultations, people coming together at conferences, uh, workshops where people come together because for instance, where forest owners can come together and they can exchange ideas and they can come up with ideas how to do things, maybe as I 
you know, as at various workshops I've heard, people coming up with an idea or that they start building together a little a trailer for their timber. And that I think is definitely the strength where people can come together in reality. Yeah, I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head there that maybe it's the peer-to-peer -peer learning that is maybe under pressure at the moment mm. or, or one of the main issues under pressure at the moment. So thanks for that, Stephen. Um, we'll now move straight on to our second presenter, Ian Baker. Now, and if you have any questions for Stephen or comments, please hold them till after Ian's presentation and we'll have plenty of time then to uh, maybe talk further with both Stephen and Ian at that stage. Now, Ian is Chief Executive Officer of the UK Small Woods Association. He's a trained ecologist and has worked in a range of public, private and voluntary sector roles, including rural economic policy, regional development, and has worked with the Countryside Council for Wales and the National Trust. He always had an interest in woodlands, having grown up amongst the beech woods of the Cotswolds and now lives near the woodlands of the Severn Valley. Ian's presentation this morning is on small woods, adapting advice and woodland manager services during the COVID-19 lockdowns. Thank you very much, uh, Nula, and uh, hello to everybody. I'm just uh, going to share my screen. Um, excellent presentation, Stephen. Really enjoyed uh, uh, listening to, to you there, and I'm sure you'll find that there are uh, real resonances in what I have to say, um, very similar experiences. Big difference for, um, in our um, context is that we are a owner organisation, so we're not in the public sector, we're a voluntary uh, sector organisation, an NGO if you like, and um, so our services all have to be funded from our own uh, members' uh, contributions um, and any other business that we can bring together. So. With slightly smaller concern, I guess, than uh, a, a national uh, agency like uh, uh, Chagosh, but um, hopefully we we manage to achieve a, a, a good reach for all of that. So, just to give you an overview of uh, the Small Woods Association or Small Woods, as we uh, abbreviate ourselves, um, this is uh, our annual re review from 2019 to 2020. So. This is quite interesting from context of what we're talking about today because it gives you a picture of where we were before we started the uh, before we came into the pandemic. So you can see we have a number of member events and those member events were always face to face. They were in woodlands owned by our, our members um, and we had a number of uh, electronic uh, communications um, and we, we have a, a, a large number of, uh, of projects. So. You hear, see here you, uh, about the health and well-being projects. Um, overall, we have about 30 projects ac across across the UK. We manage woodlands directly ourselves. But um, one of the really important things to understand about an association like ours, and um, it may well be uh, similar to the uh, speakers at the next event in um, uh, uh, from France, is that. Um, the really important part about us is the area that we represent in our members woodlands. So nearly 30,000 hectares is owned by our, our members, which for those of you who um, know uh, UK uh, NGOs, that's about the same area of woodland owned by either the National Trust or RSPB or um, the Woodland Trust. So in, in those terms, it's a very significant woodland uh, resource. Um, and uh, we also provide a lot of direct support. We provide direct support to people uh, who are woodland owners, but we also run um, what we call social forestry programs. So we're giving, providing health and well-being support to uh, to, to people. And um, roughly 5,000 people have been supported by uh, our programs in 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 one way or another. So what happened uh, in March when uh, the pandemic first hit? We saw very quickly an increase in a demand for our for our services. We saw a demand in our advisory services, so woodland owners and managers were coming to us uh, sort of with increasing uh, regularity and with completely new new needs. And I'll talk about one of those uh, shortly. At the same time, our income went down um, because uh, one of the things that we do is we run training programs. 
and obviously uh, we had to spend an awful lot of time from uh, March onwards, firstly refunding um, a lot of people who'd already um, paid us for, for courses they weren't going to be able to come on, and then um, uh, sort of abandoning uh, our, our training program dur during, during the first lockdown. Our health and wellbeing services have also been in, in, in great demand, and um, I have to say, I think that's going to continue to be the case as we go forward. People are desperate to make connection with with the uh, with the natural world, and uh, woodlands are, have been a big part of uh, how people have managed to get through uh, the pressures of the pandemic. So, and, and I guess this is the the heart of what I have to say to you today. So, what's changed and what's stayed the same? So our training, as I've already started to say, um, has been um, really uh, heavily impacted. We'll probably be able to um, count on something like 5% of the um, income for, from uh, a, a normal year in, in, in this year, um, uh, which is a huge loss. And we've decided um, to keep our, our training programme um, staff on because we, we have been planning future future programmes, um, but uh, that has led to, to a loss for the, for the organisation. We did manage, as a result of keeping those staff on, to run our training programme in autumn 2020. We managed to get from uh, the, the whole of that programme in, bar, barring the, 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 fi the final event which was an amazing uh, an achie achievement by the team. Um, and our um, next training programme starts in spring, so we do have on our website uh, train training courses starting from, from March. Whether they, th those early ones will happen or not, is, is, uh, is, we, we will see. But um, we're very much hoping that we can um, sort of start uh, yes, welcoming people to our, our training courses, uh, certainly by, by the summertime. We are trying to move online, but a lot of our courses are very analog. Um, they don't translate well to, to digital. Uh, trying to um, convert a five day coracle building course into a, into a webinar is well nigh impossible. Um, and that gives you a, a, a flavour of some of our courses we do. We do theoretical courses, so we do classroom based certificated uh, training, but we also do uh, a lot of craft training and that's a, it's a really important part of what we do. And that simply doesn't translate well to to the sort of webinar format um, because it's the, 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 they are quite long and they do need that interaction uh, around the, the tools and, and, and the objects. So training, it, there's definitely some some uh, rewards there for, for maintaining our training and looking forward to new training events, but there's there's some real challenges as well. And Stephen uh, did re uh, uh, refer to that. Our Woodland Manager events, however, um, I think they're um, more consistently successful. They've all moved online and we've had about a fourfold uptake in, uh, in those events and we've been able to run a broader range of topics. And we're certainly not going to go back to the old way of doing things. Um, uh, we'll, we will be looking at some sort of hybrid, I'm, I'm sure. Um, we do have members who are uh, challenging us and saying you shouldn't go back to any physical events because of um, climate impacts and, and everything. But we, we, the majority of our members are also desperate to get out and meet one another face to face. And um, you know, the, the nosy neighbour syndrome in Woodlands is, is, is really uh, effective. People will want to know what one another are doing and learn from that. So our advisory work, move, moving on to the right hand side of this uh, screen, um, we've done similarly to uh, to Chogosh, we've been uh, running uh, clinics online, people are bringing short videos or photographs of, of the issues they're trying to uh, trying to do, deal with. Um, we've also provided what we call comfort letters, I, I'll, I'll show you that on the next screen which are letters that um, woodland managers can take out with them um, when, um, the, sort of the, when there are lockdowns, either local lockdowns or national lockdowns, to say that what they're doing is, is essential uh, woodland work. And that's been a, a, a sort of really successful and greatly appreciated by our members. In more general outreach, 
we've been reaching thousands more people and getting thousands more uh, um, uh, connections via our social media channels. We ran a, a Nature Fix campaign um, during 2020 where we sort of daily sent out messages which people picked up, be it people who were homeschooling or, or just sort of uh, general support measures. And we've uh, we've increased the uh, the coverage of our of our newsletter. Um, the year year before it was eight, it moved up to twelve by the end of the year, and we're now at twenty four times times a year. Um, another big impact it has on the organisation, but uh, I know our members and everybody else who receives it really appreciates that. So this is the I'm sorry this is small print, but. Um, you know, it's not for you to, to necessarily uh, need to uh, understand the detail of it, but this is a letter that we produced, which um, I know a number of our members um, um, put it in a plastic case and, and put it on the uh, on the front of their, their vehicle to say what I'm doing is actually allowed. And if they ever get uh, uh, challenged by police or, or, or others, then there's there's uh, there's that letter of comfort for them. Um, which I know has been extensively used. So it's important for us to understand the impact that we have. And um, here's some uh, sort of uh, quotes from uh, some of our some of the people who respond to uh, to, to what we're doing: mental well-being uh, responses, training responses, and also our outreach um, uh, responses to our outreach. So we're looking uh, forward. Um, we're looking to do more online events. At the very least, um, it will be, um, I would say, three quarters of our program. Once we start getting the ability back to go out and meet people, I think three quarters of our program will still be online. We're looking at um, helping people understand the carbon effects of um, managing woodlands, and we want to understand that better ourselves as well. So. Um, we'll be really interested to hear what um, the, the next Forex event has got to say on that uh, on that uh, side. And we're also looking at um, developing a, um, an approach to a specific approach, a targeted approach to biodiversity improvement in, in, in woodlands, and making all those things available in over the next year. And here are some of the other things that we will be will be working on over over the coming year. So. Um, Finally, and uh, I'll wrap up in, in a second, um, I, I said to, to Nula before the event, I'll just give you a, a little uh, insight into some of the things that we uh, are looking forward to uh, try and um, uh, put on the agenda for, for, the, for the coming year or two. And we really think, feel the, sort of the central point here that um, woodlands can play a part in green recovery. They can play a part in um, skills development and they can play a part in um, and just giving people space where, where they can start to, to sort of get back in touch with the things that matter to, to them. Um, and um, that green recovery programme, we feel, needs to work on a policy level. It needs to, yes, uh, look, at, look at new planting, but it really needs to focus on people. And, and, and we see participation as being absolutely critical to, to, to this. Otherwise, if we plant more trees today, um, without a, a view of, of how people will be involved with them. We're simply planting the unused woodlands of tomorrow. And, it, and for, for those of you who've got an active uh, woodland management sector in, in your countries, it may um, really surprise you to know that um, about 40% of our woodlands are unmanaged in, 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 uh, in England. And um, it's, it's, a real, it's a real issue uh, that we, we need to get to grips with. So I'll wrap up at that point. Um, Nula and Mark, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to to speak and um, thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Ian. I think that was an, a fascinating presentation and um, it's amazing the amount of um, actions and activity that you're working on there. Um, I suppose uh, one thing, and I think it came out your presentation there that during this pandemic the multi-functional uh, benefits of forests have really come to the fore maybe amongst people who hadn't previously considered them and I see health and well-being high up on the agenda in relation to your I suppose supports to your um, clients and stakeholders there. Um, you did mention earlier on there and I was kind of fascinated to, uh, wondering why. Um, why was there an increase in demand for your services 
because it was it because of COVID nineteen or yeah. why like why did that happen? Well, we just experienced it across the whole of our our, our activities. So our activities broadly break down between the social forestry, the, the sort of health and well being side of things, and the um, and and the uh, woodland management advice training skills, etc. Um, and we saw more people coming to us, be it through the social media, be it, be it through sort of all the, the other means that people use, um, and looking for for more advice, looking for more training, and also just trying to get in contact and in, in, um, and connect with with the natural world. Um, we we saw a, a really big increase in our social media traffic, so lo lots more likes and contacts and um so I, I just think that people were looking for that connection um and from the from those who already were connected to us so those are the, the woodland mo owners and managers they knew what they wanted and they came to us for that for those of it for those who had perhaps less perception of of, of what uh, um, was out there in, in the woods i think they came to us looking for information ideas and and, and inspiration and and hopefully we manage to do both great thanks very much for that ian so uh now we come to the discussion so this is where everybody else gets to talk um so again just to remind you you can use the raise hand function on your toolbar and we and we can take your comments live if you do that or otherwise if you would prefer to submit a written question comment on the chat function We'll try to get as many of these as possible. And Mark, hopefully you're available there to support me on this. Um, can we start off, Benjamin, um, our colleague from CNPF? Um, Benjamin, do you want to ask your question live? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, I, I can do it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nuala. Uh, thank you, Jan and, and Stephen, for your presentation. It's very interesting to see how how you you cope with this uh, COVID situation, and uh, in France it's pretty much the same as we we did much more webinars and um, yeah and things in distance with the uh, with the owners and uh, the uh, the colleagues. But uh, but what I, I found very interesting is um, about your your job is uh, you, you made more more and more videos and uh, very uh, virtual events. And as you say at the end of your presentation, Stephen, uh, you you explain the resource needed to to do this job because it's a full time job, and uh, it, it it requires a specific uh, knowledge and and, uh, and and skills. So uh, I just would like to know uh, uh, what did you what, what do you mean by uh, by this resource? It's a uh, one one full time job, uh, a community manager uh, for. How many how many videos or activities he, he did during this uh, this situation that, that still continue? Um, because I, I mean, for our, our organization, we are about 400 and 400 people uh, on a national level, and I'm wondering uh, what do we need? <laughs> do we need one person to do this this job, this organization, this uh, this? So I don't know if my my question is clear for you. <laughs> It's it's very clear, and I'll be fascinated to hear Stephen's answer. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, uh, Benjamin. And yes, it's a very good question um, because uh, probably of all the different things that I said, was time is probably the most precious commodity of all. Um, Equipment-wise, I think you can do. 75 or 80 percent of what you want to achieve with the really uh, good value equipment because even let's say if you have a decent smartphone and you have a simple tripod and a lapel mic you know like a lapel mic that you cannot uh, stick on at the color of your shirt you can produce excellent videos and the videos, obviously, they need to be uh, edited afterwards. That will cost you, for I think, a good quality type of a software package about a hundred euro. Because we can now work with smartphones, and smartphones nowadays actually produce really good or are able to record really good quality video. I think that 
a lot of that can be done by colleagues. You know, as you are go as you are going about your job and you just record something, that can then easily be put together into a video afterwards. Uh, to give another idea or another suggestion, the e-newsletters. Again, for that you need software on your computer, and you need a budget. Um, in my case, an e-newsletter will cost me half a cent per email. And the software that you use, it's cloud-based. It's uh, well, it's free, obviously because you pay for it uh, through the through the emails. So naturally enough, if you're sending out a number of thousands of emails to people, naturally enough, that half a cent per email clearly becomes a couple of hundred euro, but it is a great way to, to communicate uh, with people. Um, animation videos, just to give an, 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 an example there, again, you do not need a camera. You do need a bit of software and it does cost you a couple of hundred euro per year. So I believe that if budgets are an issue, you can really do a lot with a thousand euro. You really can do a lot if you want to go more professional and you want to buy, uh, let's say, a better quality tripod or so, then I would suggest that for maybe 5,000 euro, you can really get yourself set up really, really, really well. Now, um, the, yeah? We better um, just, uh, there's a good few questions coming in, so. All right, so just yeah, to, yeah. to finish up, um, I think the, the trick is that it's a combination of uh, basic equipment, but it's especially time resources. Until recently, I spent about 25% of my time on communications. That has increased now over the since the COVID period. But I think you can do a lot if you allocate, let's say, 20% of your time to that uh, every week. Thanks, Stephen. And I suppose uh, to a certain extent, it's how long is a piece of string you could um, submit or commit a huge amount of resources. And obviously, the more you commit, the better. Um, John Burgess, um, I don't know, John, would you like to ask your question yourself and maybe say which organization you're with? If not, um, okay. Will I will I read it out? So he, um, John, are you there, John? Yes. Okay. Do, do you want me to um, answer it because I've got um. Okay. I have actually answered it. I have actually yeah. answered John. Okay. And questions. Right. So basically, John is asking: Has the increased engagement led to Woods coming into management that were not previously being managed? So. And 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 I think it's it's too early for us to 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 know definitively the answer to that, but we did survey members um, during the year and um, about a third of the people who answered the survey said that they'd um, had to do, been able to do less management in the year, but the majority of them didn't see that as a permanent impact. Um, okay. So I, I would hope that the increased engagement and the increased ability to get the message out will eventually lead to more woodlands coming into management, but but not in 2020. OK, and while you have the floor there, Ian, Liam Kelly has a question there in relation to the short courses and craft courses. Are they accredited and um, uh, and mentioned an increased interest in COVID was from existing members or from new members? So um, our, our courses, some of them are accredited and some of them aren't, and we're uh, looking to get more of them accredited. And we've uh, been working this year to to also film uh, more of those and, um, and sort of so we've got more digital resources to, to back up all the training and and the other um, point about uh, whether the members or non-members um, we we've seen an increase uh, from from both sources um, but quite often when somebody comes as a non-member they see the fact they get a 20 percent discount for our courses so they join anyway and and, and often get a cheaper course and, and free and more or less free membership out of it OK, yeah. um, Garen Linnington, would you like to ask a question there or make a comment maybe in relation to Ash Dieback? Hello, um, it's, uh, it's Garen, the Forestry Commission in Cornwall. Um, Good to hear you. Comment. It's just a comment really just to say that Ash Dieback disease, um, Hemiscyphus uh, fraxineus, 
um, has roughly doubled the number of funding license applications in the West Country. That, that's the southwest of England. Uh, I mean, that alone has increased woodland management. And I, I'm finding a lot of woodland agents that I deal with in Cornwall um, have been very active in the last year. So it's really just a statement that the industry's very active. OK, thank you for that, Garen. Um, I think uh, probably um, uh, an ongoing issue for many for many countries at this stage as well, I think. Um, we also have uh, Gail Atkinson. Uh, Gail, um, you have a, a question there for Stephen. Do you want to ask it? Yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned, um, uh, so for example, the use of text messages. And I was just wondering, um, uh, in, in terms of thinking about generating a two-way flow of information, if any of the new methods you described have been particularly good at generating a two-way flow of info. Um, I think the, the the center of everything should be uh, the, the website. It's like the, the mothership. Um, and I think that's really important. And then after that, uh, text messages can link in with that, e-newsletters uh, link in with that. And I think those would be the most important tools that you have available to you. Great, thanks. OK, thank you. Mina has a comment there. I don't know, Mina, do you want to say it as well there from your experience? No, just um, to support what, what Stephen was saying, that uh, don't don't set your um, bar too high with the video, like start and, and see if it's for you. And, and if you have a good mobile phone and a tripod and a mic, you can do amazing things. Just uh, content first, then... Uh, visuals in the beginning second. OK, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, can I, I, I'm not aware that anybody has a hand raised. Um, I'm not quite sure how to even find a raised hand. Um, or are there any questions coming in that I'm missing? Maybe there's, Mark or somebody can no, advise me. No, ra no raised hands and um, no further questions. I, but one, one thing I was going to say is that it would be um, it's it's really good actually to see what others are doing in terms of some of these videos and just to get an I some ideas because it's quite inspirational in terms of the, some of the different types of of information that's being put across in this way and and certainly I think that maybe we can use our our website perhaps to link to some of the some some of the examples out there perhaps. Yeah, and I think what's very interesting as well. Um, we have found that our reach has increased hugely. I mean, obviously for a lot of people, especially small woodland owners, forestry is only an element of what they do in their lives. And with increased use of videos, um, webinars, it gives an opportunity to people who hadn't previously had the opportunity to access our services. Um, so we have found maybe less one-to-one -one interaction, but a greater number of people coming to our events you know we had our big talking timber event there last summer and we had we had maybe four or five hundred people and f subsequently watched by maybe 700 people on the on the recorded or on the youtube recording while other years at the event we would have had maybe three or four hundred people maximum at the event so you know it really doubled the impact of what we had done so that is an advantage i suppose to delivering in this way, but maybe it's not quite as rich an experience or as interactive an experience. Um, Noel Kennedy, I see there. Do you want to ask it live there, Noel? Um, Noel, do you want to ask a question? Thank you very much. Um, Ian, Just uh, I was just very interested in your uh, health and well-being projects. Uh, I know time is short, but if you could just outline very briefly what's involved and also do you see an expanded role for them uh, post COVID? So um, we run activity programs or um, craft programs in a number of locations um, across the UK and um, people are referred to us or um, we, we, we find them through a number of um, um, uh, referral agencies. Um, because what, what we're interested in is providing those services to the people that most need them. So 
there may be people who um, are struggling to find a job, people struggling with mental health issues, people with PTSD, um, etc. So I think the first important thing is the targeting. The second important thing is uh, having a good having people who, who really know how to introduce the topic properly, so having really good uh, leaders. And then um, we, we also uh, have a, a very um, effective, I think, uh, uh, monitoring evaluation system. So we're trying, so we're learning the lessons uh, of, of, of that. So as I said, we probably, I would say the majority of that 5,000 people that we're supporting would be in the health and wellbeing um, area. Um, so that's that. I hope is a lot of people who who feel they've got a slightly better outlook on on life as a result of uh, of, of of the help that we've been able to been able to give them. Um, but Noel, if you want uh, me to give you links to to some of that more specifically, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks for that, Ian and Noel. Um, is there any other question or comment at this stage? Anybody would like to ask anything of our speakers or make a comment. Um, okay, I see one in here from Liam Kelly. Uh, Liam, do you want to ask that again? Again, in relation to Broadleaf owners? Yes. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly, yeah. Yeah, um, again, thanks very much for both uh, presentations. Um, just in relation to the small woods, is there, um, uh, I presume most interaction is in relation to Broadleafs or hardwood growers. And also, is there much interest in new planting among among uh, members? Um, most of our um, members either have broadleaf woodlands or they have a um, what we call a, a pause site. So it'll be a um, a, a um, plantation site, which uh, they're looking to to turn back to to a a, a broadleaf uh, usage. Um, do we see uh, much interest in new planting? There's some, we have got. We do have quite a lot of resistance within the membership to the idea of, of planting. Um, there's a very strong feeling towards uh, natural regeneration, but I think that reflects the fact that our members are generally mem uh, owners of existing woods. So they don't generally own open land on which you can plant. So uh, people come to join the Small Woods Association because they own a woodland, um, um, not generally because they want to plant one. Um, there are one or two exceptions to that, but that's that in terms of our membership, um, that's that's where they're at. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank okay, you. thanks very much. And conscious of time, and uh, we're coming to the end of our first Forex Friday, so hopefully you found it interesting. And remember to tune into future Forex Fridays, and you know already, I presume, that they're going to be held on the last Friday of every month. And the next Forex Friday will be held on the 26th of February, again at 1 p.m. Central European time, which is 12 o'clock over our part of the world. Um, the focus will be on voluntary carbon schemes, which should be very interesting. And this uh, Forex Friday will be facilitated by Benjamin Chapelet from CNPF France and will include a presentation on La Belle Bass Carbon as well. So I'm really looking forward to that. I think it's very topical at the moment. Um, uh, before we finish, I'd just like to thank our presenters today, Ian Baker and Stephen Mayan, for their very interesting and thought-provoking presentations, and also for their answers to your questions. I'd like to thank Mark Pryor for his introduction and also for his help with the questions. In the background, I'd particularly like to thank Mina Corhonen of EFI for all her work in setting up this meeting and also for facilitating today's session. And finally, to you, our very engaged audience and participants, thanks for attending and for your contributions to today's meetings. Uh, so till we meet again, stay safe and good afternoon. <laughs>